Okay, so today let us uh, start a new topic which is uh, understanding how fluids behave that is fluid dynamics. So um, the uh, subject of fluid dynamics of course is a very old one and uh, it is associated with the names of uh, Euler and uh, many others uh, including Navier and Stokes and so on. Okay, so uh, what I will do is that I will be discussing uh, uh, two aspects to the fluids. One is uh, uh, a, a fluid which does not exhibit viscosity. So viscosity is a phenomenon where the layers of the fluid uh, uh, you know exert a friction force on uh, adjoining layers. So there is some kind of an internal friction. So that is an important topic but uh, it is a difficult topic so I will relegate that to the end of this uh, discussion. So the initial topics will be basically the ideal fluid where there is, there is no viscosity. So uh, for an ideal fluid uh, you encounter what are called uh, Euler equations which are basically a combination of uh, kinematics and dynamics. So the kinematics will tell you how the conservation laws appear, uh, uh, I mean just like in the case of electromagnetic theory you had conservation laws where uh, charge was conserved here also you know the net mass of uh, a fluid within a volume if it is not conserved it is because fluid is either flowing in or out of the system. So that is a kind of equation of continuity. So uh, that is going to be uh, our focus and then we will also understand what are the role of forces and how fluids respond to forces. So the basic difference between an elastic body and a fluid is that uh, an elastic body deforms under the application of shear stress whereas a fluid uh, flows under the application of shear stress that means it accelerates. So now we will have to understand fluids because you see the uh, formalism of uh, elasticity theory that we just uh, completed discussing is not particularly suitable to discuss fluids because uh, uh, if fluids do not uh, deform under the application of shear stress so they accelerate or flow and there was no uh, room for such a description in the earlier topic namely uh, the study of deformable elastic bodies it was assumed that uh, the elastic body simply deforms it does not uh, accelerate. So a rigid body by contrast always accelerates it does not deform. So fluid is something in between. Okay, so so that's the reason why we need a um, somewhat new approach. So what we'll do is that we will uh, take this approach that the fluid is described initially. It's more convenient, intuitively easy to understand when you think of fluid as being composed of point particles. But in fact, they are. Uh, that is the correct description anyway. But then you see in the end we really do not want to dwell on that uh, aspect that we do not want to uh, in, in some sense in the end we want to uh, hide that, uh, that quality of the fluid namely that it is actually composed of uh, elementary entities discrete objects. So rather uh, we want to think of fluids as something continuous. Uh, so, uh, but then that is more easily achieved by first thinking of fluid as, as in terms of uh, discrete entities that have their own dynamics and then uh, finding a way to hide that information and only display the information that corresponds to the continuum description. Okay, so how do you do that? So to do that we uh, start off with this definition of uh, the density of a fluid at some point r at a given time t. So now like I told you just now uh, I am going to think of this fluid as uh, consisting of uh, a large number of discrete entities so discrete particles for example capital N of them and let us assume that each of them have mass m. And then uh, clearly from our classical mechanics uh, background we can uh, uh, reel off uh, a bunch of uh, facts about these uh, collection, this collection of particles namely that if r i is the position of the ith particle at time t, uh, the velocity of the ith particle is going to be the rate of change of uh, r i with t. 
So, and that is what we call as V i. So, now given the fact that we have this R i and V i, so in other words something like phase space. So, uh, we can uh, construct certain objects which are going to be of immense uh, value later on when we try to describe the fluid. The first uh, quantity of interest is what is known as the density of particles at a given position r at time t. So, uh, clearly you see if you think of a fluid as uh, being composed of discrete particles you know it you might think that is quite an absurd uh, concept to introduce because after all what is density is just the uh, in this case is the number density it is the number of particles per unit volume. But then I am not talking about a finite volume I am talking about at some point uh, so that means that you, you choose a point r and you look at a really really tiny volume delta v and you count how many particles there are which is delta n and your delta n divided by delta v is your density there. But uh, if you have modeled your particles are discrete that limiting process is meaningless because the moment you go if your volume is smaller than the interparticle uh, separation cubed for example, then uh, you would necessarily get 0 as your answer most of the time because uh, most of the points do not uh, I mean the most whatever point r you select in space will typically be unoccupied by a particle. So, if the particles are point objects so they occupy only some point. So, even though that seems absurd but it is also true that the moment that r becomes equal to the location of one of the particles the density is in fact infinite. So, in other words it has this property that the density is infinite when r is exactly one of the uh, locations of the particle and it is 0 when r is not uh, one of the locations of the particle. So, that should immediately make you recall an important concept that you ought to know by now and that is the concept of the Dirac delta function. So, the Dirac delta function is precisely that uh, concept which has this property namely it is 0 if uh, you know the argument is not uh, 0 and it, it is infinite when the argument is 0. So, so I am going to uh, go ahead and uh, define the density of particles at position r at time t to be the uh, sum of all the Dirac delta functions for the particles at various locations. So, this uh, ensures that uh, if I am looking at position r the density is going to be 0 if r is not equal to any of those uh, positions where the particles are located. So, clearly you know we expect that to be the case. So, if this is where all your particles are there then if your position r is this then clearly density is 0. But it is so if r hits one of them say r 3. So, if this this r is exactly r 3 then clearly the in density is infinite. So, that is what this uh, definition ensures. So, then now you can see that if you integrate over all r, so if I do this right, so if I uh, find out the total uh, number of particles, so this is the total number of particles because recall that rho r comma t is the number density, the number of particles per unit volume at position r at time t. So, this is the total number. So, now if I integrate this out what do I get? I basically get uh, so integral of the Dirac delta is 1 and this is just uh, 1 being summed over n times. So, that is basically n and that is exactly what we expect because we expect the total number of particles to be capital N. So, this is uh, consistent with what we expect so we will go along with this. So, in addition to uh, the number density of uh, particles we also have to introduce what is called the current density. So, that is the uh, number of particles flowing per unit area per unit time uh, you know in some particular direction right. So, that is what uh, current density is. So, it is it's, uh, some kind of a flux, the flux of particles tells you uh, how fast the particles are moving across a given cross sectional area. 
So uh, to define that we, uh, we clearly, so you must know that it is you know, it is just this, this is what it is going to be because uh, what this is basically uh, this will tell you it is, uh, so V has dimensions of length by time and this has dimensions of density, so that is one, 1 by length cubed, right. So this is basically 1 by time by length square. So in other words dimensionally what this is saying is the number of particles flowing per unit time per cross sectional area L square at least dimensionally. But physically also that is the meaning it has. In fact uh, to convince yourself that this has that physical meaning you, you what you have to do is you have to relate these two namely you have to relate the current density to the number density and that is when you get to know the real physical meaning. But dimensionally it is clear that that is likely to be the physical meaning of that. Uh, so let us go ahead and relate rho and j. So how do you do that? Uh, you see uh, look uh, rho depends on time because the position of the particle depends on time. So now I am going to go ahead and differentiate with respect to time and then you will see that uh, by chain rule I have to first differentiate the argument which is same as differentiating r because it appears as a difference and that is going to be the gradient times the derivative of uh, the argument of the delta function with respect to time and that is minus dri by dt. And what is dri by dt? It is precisely the velocity of the ith particle. So now uh, that is going to be uh, what it is for d rho by dt, okay. So this is, uh, yeah, I forgot a step. So this is basically vi. So now however if I take the divergence of j I get the same thing without the minus sign because if you take the divergence of j you will get uh, vi dot grad acting on the delta function. So now if you add these two uh, you will clearly get 0 because uh, they are the same apart from a sign. So now this is the equation of continuity and this will tell you the precise meaning of that. So if you uh, you know it's this we have encountered this again and again in many contexts uh, for example in uh, electromagnetic theory and so on. So in, you integrate over r this is just going to be the number of particles. Uh, so if you integrate over some volume so this is the number of particles and this is nothing but the uh, flux j dot n because you can use Gauss's theorem and so what this says is the so if suppose this is j and this is uh, suppose j is parallel to n okay what this is saying is that so j is the number of particles flowing out in this case so flowing in the direction of j which is n so n is out so uh, so it's the number of particles flowing in the direction of j per unit area per unit time and if i multiply by ds so what i'm doing is basically i'm counting how many particles are flowing out per unit time okay and uh, so clearly that with a minus sign is exactly the rate of change of the number of particles with time because if particles are flowing out n decreases with time so dn by dt is going to be negative and magnitude wise it is going to be exactly that this is the number of particles flowing out per unit time. So that is the reason why j has that interpretation. So I I dimensionally gave you the interpretation of why j has the interpretation of number of particles uh, flowing in the direction of j per unit area per unit time and the correct technical reason is because of this. So you derive the continuity equation and you integrate over a volume and this uh, rigorously has that interpretation not just dimensionally but physically also. So that is as far as the kinematics is concerned. So you see we have not had any occasion to uh, use the information of the forces that may or may not be acting on the particles. So I have not even told you if forces are acting, they could be acting, they could not be acting. So far I have not used that information at all, So, but I am going to use that later on. But even before you use that information there is one important um, set of uh, properties that you can derive about this rho and j uh, which involves again only kinematics and that is what is known as current algebra. So basically current algebra is uh, in this context uh, a relation 
which tells you that uh, the Poisson bracket of the density and the various components of the current, uh, they are all uh, related linearly to each other. Okay. So, that is called a Lie algebra. So, you see it is an algebra in the sense that uh, the uh, Poisson bracket operation is a linear one. So, the Poisson bracket of A plus B with C is uh, Poisson bracket of A with C and B with C. So, that is the reason why uh, it is called a Lie algebra, but you do not have to get stuck on the terminology. Bottom line is that what you do is you evaluate the Poisson bracket of uh, because after all rho and j involve the positions of the particles and we know from classical mechanics how to calculate Poisson bracket if you know the velocities and positions of the particles. Rho and j depend on the velocities and positions of the individual particles. Then you can easily convince yourself the Poisson bracket of rho and rho even when r and r dash are different, but so long as times are the same they are going to be 0. And uh, similarly, uh, so I am not going to dwell on the uh, you know the derivation because it is just a tedious uh, algebraic manipulation which you have to simply go through patiently. So, bottom line is that, so it has this relation. So, the Poisson bracket of rho and uh, rho with two different r and r dash uh, are 0. Whereas, the Poisson bracket of rho and an appropriate component of uh, the current is again proportional to rho and the proportionality will depend on r and r dash. Okay? And of course, the component that you are talking about in this case L and, and one should not forget the mass, each particle has a mass. So, remember there are four things in uh, the, the four quantities that we are talking about. One is density, the other is uh, say the x component of current, third is y component of current, fourth is z component of current. So, there are four objects. So, we have to find out the Poisson bracket between any two of them. So, rho rho is 0, Poisson bracket rho rho is 0, rho with any other component of L is uh, determined by this formula and lastly j, j with other components of j. So, that also can be evaluated and when you evaluate uh, the answer comes out to be this. So, it is basically a, a linear combination of these two j's themselves, but uh, with appropriate uh, r and r dash and so on. Okay, so, uh, you might be wondering why I mentioned this. I mentioned this firstly because it is interesting in its own right in the sense that the Poisson bracket of rho and uh, various components of j they form a closed algebra means the Poisson bracket does not involve anything other than rho and the various components of j. You do not have to invoke new notions because that is going to be very useful because remember I told you that in the end I want to uh, hide the fact that uh, a fluid is contained or made of uh, discrete number of particles, but then uh, till now I have not had uh, you know a proper way of doing that and the first inkling that it might be possible to do that comes actually from the equation of continuity itself. You see even though rho and j themselves depend on uh, the discrete particles, uh, the definitions depend on the discrete particles involved, but the equation of continuity has no mention of that. There is no mention of Ri or Vi in equation 4.107. So, in other words, the information that the fluid actually consists of discrete particles is hidden in the background. So, eventually that we are actually going to forget about it altogether. Okay, so, so this is one equation that uh, uh, allows us to later on forget about the fact that the fluid is made of discrete particles. So, similarly uh, with Poisson bracket as well you can see that these Poisson brackets also do not have any information that the rows and j's are actually in the end made of uh, the discrete particles that we were uh, initially talking about. So, even though uh, notice that in order to derive these Poisson brackets, we had to explicitly make use of the fact that uh, the rows and j's are described in terms of discrete particles.
So, we had to make use of it, but having made use of it the end result is that the Poisson brackets do not retain any information about uh, the discreteness of the underlying system. So, that is very interesting. So, these two uh, aspects namely the equation of continuity and uh, the uh, Poisson bracket between rho and various components of J will allow us to eventually uh, be faithful to our original intention namely that we want to describe fluid as something continuous that flows okay, rather than some grainy discrete collection of particles. Okay, so, uh, having done all this uh, let us go ahead and see, but uh, okay. Uh, so, in order to motivate the next uh, discussion I have to point out one thing and that is that uh, the Poisson bracket that we derived uh, even though they look very nice, they are still not simple enough because you see uh, the Poisson bracket of rho and rho is 0 that is nice, that is simple it cannot be any simpler than that. But then rho and uh, some component of j uh, is uh, proportional to rho, yes this is also simple and I doubt you can make it any simpler than this, but what is not simple is this j with j. So, I would much rather, uh, so even, even this uh, if I could I would much rather make it simpler. So, in other words what I ideally want is I want to redefine rho and j or any one of them in terms of other quantities such that the Poisson bracket of those uh, will involve some constants on the right side. So, I do not want it to again involve uh, rho and j or something similar. So, I do not want dynamical variables on the right hand side. So, uh, first uh, identity does that already is identically 0, second one does not do that. So, I want to avoid that. So, in other words I want to, I want to redefine j and rho in such a way that the right hand side of the Poisson bracket is actually uh, something unrelated to the dynamical variable. So, in other words it involves only r and r, r prime which we regard as something fixed, somebody has told us what they are. So, how do we do that? So, the way we do that, uh, so, so the reason why we want that is because it makes uh, you know calculations successively simpler. So, the way to do that is to define uh, what is called the velocity of the fluid rather than the velocity of the individual particles which we have identified as v i. We now define velocity of the fluid and that is defined as basically through this relation. So, the current density is uh, postulated to be equal to the particle density times the velocity of the fluid. So, in other words v is by definition j by rho of course, this makes sense only for points r where a rho is not 0. So, now the question is uh, why is this uh, simpler to do? So, what I am going to do is uh, rather than find the Poisson bracket of the various components of j and rho, I am going to try and find the Poisson bracket of rho and the various components of the velocity of the fluid. So, that would make more sense. So, I am going to use identities such as this uh, and then go ahead and substitute uh, this definition here. Okay. So, if you substitute that here you will see you will get exactly what I was talking about. So, so you just substitute uh, this relation 4.115 you substitute it uh, in this relation. So, you just write uh, J L as rho times V L and then you work out therefore, what should uh, the Poisson bracket of rho and v l b. So, you will find in fact it is this namely the uh, Poisson bracket of rho and the velocity of the fluid is something unrelated to any of the dynamical variables. It depends on r and r prime. So, they, they are just uh, fixed positions in space. All right. So, uh, this achieves what I had set out to do, but uh, I am a little greedy I want it to be even simpler. And uh, so, instead of having a gradient of a delta function, I want a delta function on the right side. So, therefore, I am going to define a new quantity called pi. I am going to say uh, surmise that the velocity of the fluid therefore, should be 
proportional to the gradient of that scalar. Okay, so this is called irrotational. So this would correspond to an irrotational fluid. Okay, so this is uh, the velocity is derived from a uh, potential because the curl of V is zero, so it's irrotational. So now we go ahead and substitute this here, and you can convince yourself uh, the pi and rho have this property. The Poisson bracket of pi and rho is basically the Dirac delta function. Okay. So the question, last question is that uh, how would this? Uh, so instead of J and J A and J B, we are now compelled to look at this B A and V B. So is that going to be something simple? And you will see that in fact it is simple. And uh, in fact, you will be able to convince yourself that uh, the Poisson bracket of pi and pi are zero. So after a long calculation, you will convince yourself that in fact the Poisson bracket of uh, pi and pi are zero. So there is one subtle point which uh, I have been struggling with, uh, which I will of course uh, discuss later, and that is this uh, identification that the velocity is rotational is not entirely obvious. It could be something. I mean, at this stage, it's not obvious that the velocity is rotational. You could always uh, add something to it. Uh, such that the Poisson bracket of rho, because after all, Poisson bracket of rho with any other rho is zero. So you, so even if you add some function of rho, it's still valid. So it's not clear at all that uh, the velocity has to be necessarily rotational. But later I will convince you that uh, in fact it is the case that the velocity is rotational in this example. Okay, so those technical details I will discuss later. Okay, so now let us move to something uh, important and that is uh, trying to understand how to incorporate forces that may be acting on the uh, particles of the fluid. So till now we had only discussed kinematics, so in other words the continuity equation only uh, it is basically a kinematic relation, it is uh, it's true regardless of whether forces are or are not acting on the particles. Similarly, the Poisson bracket uh, identities are also kinematic. They are always true regardless of whether forces are there or not. However, the next uh, topic is of course, uh, you, I mean the fluid, the behavior of the fluid is incomplete until you specify what forces are acting because uh, merely knowing the continuity equation will not allow us to you know explain how the fluid flows because that is very incomplete information. So we have to take into account the forces that are acting on the particles of the fluid. So of course we are going to start with our uh, familiar starting point which is Newton's second law. We are going to write mass times acceleration. So mass times acceleration is force. So now I am going to uh, rather than, uh, so in the case of continuity equation, I inquired about uh, the uh, properties of the rate of change of the density of particles, so the density of fluid, uh, density of the fluid at position r at time t and how the density changes with time. So now I am going to, uh, so that, that involved only kinematics, so the answer to that question involved only kinematics. Whereas the uh, next obvious question is how does the current density change with time uh, clearly involves uh, more than kinematics, it is going to also involve dynamics. Because uh, you know the current is basically related to the velocity of individual particles and rate of change of velocity is clearly acceleration and acceleration necessarily involves knowing what forces are acting. Okay, so uh, so just let's uh, blindly differentiate the current density with respect to time. Then what you'll find is that remember that J was defined as R i dot, which is velocity, times the Dirac delta of R minus R i. So if I differentiate with time, I get this this. So I get these two uh, relations. Okay. So now uh, I am going to uh, write acceleration as force divided by mass and uh, so now I am uh, gradually allowing myself to simplify or explicitly write down what the rate of change of current with the time should be in terms of again 
uh, variables that do not involve the explicit discrete positions of the particles or their velocities. So, I want to be able to answer this question, what is the rate of change of the current density of the fluid only in terms of properties of the fluid, namely the current density of the fluid and the particle density of the fluid, rho and j. I do not want to involve r i and v i. So, involving r i and v i uh, even at the last step would mean that you are describing the fluid not in terms of continuous uh, an object that is uh, a continuum rather than you are invoking the, its discrete nature which is not something what we want to do. So, uh, so now how do we uh, proceed beyond this? So, we are going to assume that uh, the Dirac delta function is, uh, so at this stage it is very hard to proceed further until you make some concessions. And the concession we are going to make is the following that I am going to uh, simplify this uh, make by assuming this Dirac delta function is actually a limiting case of some well behaved object. So, we all know that uh, in at least by physicists define Dirac delta function as the limit of a sequence of well behaved functions. So, so just uh, uh, think of uh, as a well behaved sequence of functions parameterized by epsilon where you define epsilon by pi x squared plus epsilon squared. And then what physicists do is that we think of uh, epsilon tends to 0 and then we say that look uh, uh, this is Dirac delta function, the limit as epsilon tends to 0. Bottom line is that uh, that limit really um, does not exist as a bona fide function, it goes outside the space of uh, bona fide functions. So, they are called generalized functions. So, just like you know a limit of a sequence of rational numbers need not be rational. So, it goes outside the space of rationals. So, similarly the limit of a sequence of bona fide functions like a epsilon by uh, pi divided by x squared. So, this is perfectly regular, it is infinitely many times differentiable, it is continuous whatever. But then its limit uh, as epsilon tends to 0 is anything but regular. So, just like uh, if you can always construct a sequence of rational numbers that finally converge to square root of 2. So, that goes outside this uh, sequence of rational numbers. So, since we have made peace with that idea, we should also be able to make peace with this idea that uh, the limit of a sequence of uh, perfectly well behaved functions may not be well behaved. So, that is what we are going to do. So, then in that case the three dimensional Dirac delta function. So, I, I have not put in that delta with a three reminder there, I have to put a three reminder on top. So, we will all assume that when the arguments are vectors, it is really the three dimensional Dirac delta function. So, in which case uh, this three dimensional delta function is just delta of x times delta of y times delta of z. Okay, so, uh, the reason why I made this uh, reinterpretation is because I want to be able to make sense out of a delta of 0. See normally is delta of 0 is actually infinite, but then before taking this epsilon tends to 0, delta of 0 is not infinite. In fact, delta of 0 is 1 by pi epsilon. It is only when epsilon tends to 0, it is infinite. So, I am going to assume that provisionally epsilon is small, but not yet 0. So, in which case it makes perfect sense to talk of delta of 0. So, in which case uh, if it makes sense to talk of delta of 0, then I can happily put uh, rho of r i. So, I can ask what is this. So, I knew the answer to this which is just the sum of Dirac deltas, but uh, so that is clearly 0 unless r is equal to r i and when r equals r i it is actually infinite. It is infinite because the answer is delta of 0 and delta of 0 is infinite, but in my way of doing things now the delta of 0 has ren been rendered finite because I have smeared it out, I have used as so I have I have not yet taken the epsilon tends to 0 limit. So, therefore, I am entitled to write this. So, it is a rho of r i equals delta of 0. Similarly, j of r i is uh, r i dot times delta of 0. So, this allows me to write uh, the velocity of the ith particle as the density of the fluid at r i divided by so, it is basically the velocity of the fluid at r i, that is hardly surprising, that is fairly obvious. Uh, 
so it is the velocity of the fluid at position R i. So now the reason why I want to do this is because I want to uh, go ahead and insert this relation here okay. So I want to insert this relation here because R i dot appears there and uh, see I have managed to get rid of the R i uh, with 2 dots which is acceleration I have written in terms of the force but there is this annoying uh, R i dot here and there. I want to rewrite that in terms of the fluid. So remember what I am doing, I am consciously trying to get rid of the discrete uh, particle description and trying to uh, rewrite everything in terms of fluids. So, so therefore I have written R i dot which is the velocity of the ith particle now as the uh, current density of the fluid at R i uh, divided by the number density of the fluid at R i. So when I do that I get this relation, so it is the gradient uh, with respect to R i, so this is clearly in this, this acts only on R by definition okay, so uh, this can happily be outside. So, so that is just the kth component and then this V k, so it is basically uh, this is V dot grad and this is V. All right. So now because I have taken this gradient outside and this is inside, now I can go ahead and confidently replace the R i's by R. You see what I am doing? So I purposely did this because I want to systematically find a way of uh, you know simply getting rid of the particle descriptions altogether. So now because of this Dirac delta function R i is equal to R. So I can now eliminate that R i and then I replace it by R okay. So now uh, when I do that, so what I get here is basically, uh, so I get J by rho times J k by rho times sigma i delta of R minus R i right, so that is what I get. So and then there is a sigma k and grad k outside okay. So that is what this is. Now what is sigma i because now here all the r i's have become r. So the sigmas can now be taken inside here and then sigma i of delta of r minus r i is nothing but precisely the density again and these two densities cancel and you get only a g k there. So otherwise it was j, j vector by rho times j k by rho times sigma i delta of r minus r i but then sigma i delta of r minus r i is again rho. So this row cancels with this row and you get this okay and uh, similarly here this becomes f of r, r i becomes r and this becomes f of r t and this sigma of i becomes rho. So you see uh, it is quite amazing that with this uh, simple uh, uh, device of uh, you know reinterpreting the delta function make, rendering it unsingular allows us to very cleanly derive what is eventually going to be called the Euler equation which is basically tells you how the current density in the fluid changes with time. So you see that in 4.131 there is no reference to the underlying particle description of the fluid. So it only involves the properties of the fluid and the forces that are acting on the fluid. So it involves rho and it involves j, rho is the number of particles uh, of the, uh, basically it is the, it's the number density of the fluid okay. So and if you multiply by mass it becomes mass density, the mass of the fluid per unit volume so that is even more compelling because then mass of the fluid, uh, you can think of the fluid as a continuous entity and then you have, you focus on any volume and you will find some mass there. So now we go ahead and uh, so so we are almost there and this is uh, this is all we need because you see the equation of continuity was the other one which told me how the uh, density of the fluid changes with time. Now this equation tells me how the current density changes with time. So put together I have uh, what I need okay. So, so now I am just going to the rest of the journey is uh, kind of uh, you know it's smooth sailing because uh, we already defined j as uh, the particle density times the uh, 
velocity of the fluid. So in other words, we know that we have introduced a concept called velocity of the fluid which allows us to write the current density of the fluid as rho times v. So when you do that, uh, you get this relation, okay, and then you expand it out and you cancel a whole bunch of terms and you get this very simple beautiful relation. So what this tells you is that the rate of change of the velocity of the fluid is just the uh, force of acting on the fluid divided by mass, but there is an extra term uh, caused by the fact that the velocity of the fluid can change from point to point and this is what is called the convective derivative. So this is the convective derivative. So what it says is that uh, you see, so uh, you can have a situation where so how do you interpret this 4.135? What this is saying is that normally if you apply force, there has to be an acceleration. So if you take a bunch of particles, you apply force, they will accelerate. But a fluid can do something more interesting. So you can have a situation where you apply force, uh, the velocity of the fluid remains independent of time. So you can have a situation where this is always zero. There is no explicit dependence on time. So the velocity of the fluid uh, remains independent of time, but the application of force will then mean that the velocity of the fluid uh, changes from point to point. So at different points, the fluid has a different velocity. So, so the so a fluid can do something more interesting than what a point particle can do. A point particle will simply necessarily accelerate under application of forces, but whereas a fluid can do something more interesting. It, it can certainly accelerate, but it can also choose not to accelerate, but instead uh, redistribute its velocities uh, in such a way that uh, this equation is obeyed. So in other words, the application of force will cause the velocity of the fluid to uh, become spatially dependent. So in other words, it will, it will exhibit spatial inhomogeneity. Okay. So typically what happens is that the force that you are talking about is uh, writable in this way. So this is actually force per unit volume I should, so that is really the force, yeah, because dimensionally this is velocity, so this is force, it's not force per, yeah, so uh, it's, it's actually the force and so this is, this force can be written as, uh, so just typically what happens is that uh, uh, you normally think of force as being derivable from a potential, but in this case uh, we think of uh, something else has derivable from a potential and uh, and that is uh, rho times f is derivable from a potential and that is uh, defined as grad p okay rho is the um, density of the fluid okay so we think of that as the derivable from a potential and uh, so that's called grad p okay so and p is the pressure so that it has the interpretation of pressure so this is the pressure of the fluid and you can also have a force because of gravity for example you know if the fluid has mass and it's uh, it's on earth uh, it will exhibit uh, acceleration due to gravity and then uh, you ha also have uh, a relation which tells you how the density of the fluid changes with time and that will depend on the velocity of the fluid so uh, these two equations when solved with appropriate initial conditions will tell you how the fluid flows you know subsequent to the application of a force. So you have some initial condition, you apply some forces and then you want to know what the fluid does subsequently. The solution of 4.136 which is what is called Euler's equation and 4.137 which is the equation of continuity. So this is the equation of continuity. and this is the uh, Euler equation. So these two e uh, equations put together will tell you how the fluid flows uh, subsequent to the application of some force uh, with appropriate initial conditions. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and in the next class I will give you some simple examples uh, of uh, fluids and uh, we'll try and work out the solutions to this in some simple contexts. So keep in mind that uh, this description uh, necessarily omits the important, one important property of a realistic fluid namely that
it has an internal friction. So, I have only considered external forces, forces external to the fluid uh, to be acting on the fluid. So, I have not considered the possibility that you know different parts of the fluid can exert forces on other parts of the fluid. So, that means the adjacent layers of the fluid can rub against each other and cause an internal kind of friction that is completely omitted. So, this F vector is external to the fluid. So, towards the end of this uh, topic on fluids, I am going to include uh, this discussion of viscosity which involves uh, taking into account the forces that are acting inside the fluid. So, different layers of the fluid exert forces on each other. So, okay, I am going to stop now and in the next class, let us continue our discussion of fluid dynamics. Thank you. Mm -hmm.